Today, BVI House Asia brings together some of the members of Team BVI Asia for a roundtable discussion on business in Asia, the opportunities and challenges. Team BVI Asia comprises a group of outstanding, experienced, and trusted practitioners doing business in Asia. They come from the world's leading corporate firms, trust companies, law firms, and others involved in the global financial services industry. They have helped their clients do business in Asia collectively for more than 25 years and are market experts when it comes to understanding the BVI and the business and personal wealth need of their clients in Asia and throughout the world. Some practitioners are based here in Hong Kong, some in Singapore and others throughout the region. They are skilled at providing tailored, customized services to their clients across Asia to manage and preserve their globally diversified assets. Today, they discuss business in Asia, the opportunities and challenges. Uh, I'm Robert Greaves uh, from Hamilton Advisors. I'm moderating this panel today. We have with us uh, members of Team BVI uh, Asia, uh, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'm going to start with Richard. Thank you, Robert. My name is Richard Hall. I'm a partner with Collins Dillon Kierman based here in Hong Kong. We advise on all offshore jurisdictions, including in particular BBI. I have a particular focus myself on corporate work and as a firm we cover the whole range of legal uh, matters and topics that are relevant in the, in the region. Thank you. Alan. Thanks, Robert. I'm Alan Collins. I'm an executive director of a firm called uh, New Haven. Uh, we uh, have offices in various offshore jurisdictions, uh, including the BBI. I look after the Hong Kong operation, which deals with uh, Hong Kong, China, and uh, Far East Asia. Uh, we provide uh, solutions for clients for corporate planning, trusts, uh, and wealth management. And uh, we uh, have a particular focus on the BBI, where we have an office uh, which is very busy and uh, hopefully uh, continues to be so. Great. Jonathan. Thanks, Robert. Jonathan Clifton from uh, OAL. I'm the uh, Group Managing Director uh, and part of the Vista Group. Uh, the Vista Group has roughly 1,400 people now. Um, uh, I'm based in here in Hong Kong um, and we do a lot of work with, with the BBI, uh, ranging from simple incorporations to a range of corporate services through to some uh, wealth planning and succession, um, the succession planning um, requirements. Great. Thank you. Paul? Paul Christopher. Uh, managing partner for Hong Kong from around the Ozans. We operate in a number of jurisdictions in Hong Kong. 50% of the work that we do is BVI related, covering funds, corporate, finance, litigation, and international trust and private client. Thank you, Paul. John? Uh, John Rogers, and the managing partner of Waters in Singapore. Uh, we have offices here in Hong Kong and in Singapore. We have a large focus on BVI with an office there ourselves. Like my colleagues, we focus on finance, corporate, and funds, um, and we uh, have about 45 lawyers in Asia. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'd like to start uh, address the first question to Jonathan, if I may. Um, offshore financial centers have been described variously as the plumbing of the global financial services industry. Um, Jonathan, can you just tell us a little bit more? How does this work, and, and how does it work in such things as cross-border trade? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an, an interesting analogy, the concept of the plumbing or the wiring of the uh, the, the global economic system. And, and I think it's one that's been gaining traction over the past few years, because if you think about the concept of globalization, that, that's something that's well known to, to many people and has been in, in, in the kind of the vocabulary of sort of modern economics for the past 30 or 40 years. But what isn't so well known is the role that the uh, offshore centers or the offshore industry plays in actually enabling uh, globalization. So if you think about it, anything that involves uh, a cross-border uh, activity, be it uh, one organization by another organization, whether it's a, a JV investing into a, a new country, whether it's uh, setting up a factory and, and uh, facilitating capital flow, all of this requires uh, a system to enable it. Then. And uh, the, the plumbing analogy that we use is to describe what these uh, entities or structures actually enable. It enables the cross-border capital flow that uh, we see. And, you know, often it's the, uh, the banks, the financial institutions that uh, people are well-versed in terms of their role that uh, these, these guys play. But it's important to, to be able to uh, articulate 
the role that the offshore centres play. So, again, I guess anything that involves um, uh, cross-border activity, cross-border transactions, that's why we would describe it. We'll use the analogy as the plumbing of the system. That's very interesting. Thank you. So, in 2015, um, the, what is the trend? Is it is it becoming more important? Are these structures becoming more important, less important? What what would you see as the major trend line? Yeah, well, I think you, you go to what's happening um, at a macro level. You know, do you believe in the fact that um, globalization will continue? Do you believe that uh, companies and countries will continue to operate outside of their own borders and jurisdiction? And, and for me, the answer is yes. So if you believe in globalization, then I, what we see, certainly from our perspective, is an increase in demand for the underlying entities, whether it's for um, you know holding assets, whether it's for facilitating capital flow, whether it's for raising capital or debt, all, all of that sort of plays a part in, in, in globalization. Mm -hmm. So um, our, certainly our view and, and our sense is that you're seeing a continued growth in, in the demand, the underlying demand for these structures. Um, you know that there's multiple uh, there's multiple sources for why clients may choose to, to set up a structure, but uh, as a whole, at a macro level, I think we're seeing very, you know, very consistent growth um, across the whole industry. Great. Um, if we drill down into Asia, since we are in Hong Kong, let's, if you look around the region, can you, can you pinpoint where the, where the demand is strongest or where it's coming from? Yeah, I think the, um, you know, the, the, obvious, uh, the obvious country um, for the past 15, 20 years uh, is China. Uh, China has been a, a significant um, originator of business for, for the past uh, two, two decades or so. But again, it's not uh, it's not a purely China market. I think there are a number of uh, number of countries across Southeast Asia that are really starting to see an increase in demand. So places like Indonesia, Vietnam, um, Thailand, uh, and we're all sort of seeing growth in these markets, but uh, you know, Hong Kong originated business, Singapore originated business, Taiwanese originated business, all, all of these uh, all of these countries have um, different reasons for, for demand, but again, the, at, a, at a macro level and, and underlying uh, demand level, volumes are, are seen to be, to be growing. Fantastic. Um, is there anything you'd like to add? Is there anything that I'm missing here in my questioning that you'd like to tell me about? Um, I think I'd probably use the analogy of a five-star hotel. So people might look at a five-star hotel and see all the, the beautiful uh, rooms and appliances and pools, but if the, uh, if the plumbing doesn't work, if the wiring isn't there, then the whole thing falls apart. So again, that's, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, perceptions about the role the industry plays, and often it's linked to negative perceptions, but I think part of the, part of the benefits of, of bringing people like uh, this group together is to try and uh, put forward um, you know, an alternate view to, to be able to explain that. It's not all about sort of tax dodging. Richard, coming back to you, Jonathan, the, it must be um, English common law backs all of this, and, and that must be very important. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think if it's um, if we're talking um, China and, and the role that uh, BVI and other jurisdictions have, have played, part of the uh, part of the underlying part of the underlying reason for that is the professional independent infrastructure that uh, the BVI can can provide. Uh, that gives a lot of confidence or, or, or surety to investors into a country such as China. But it's it's obviously not just China. I think uh, across Asia. Different uh, different countries, different uh, economies are at different stages of their own evolution. So, um, being able to utilize or effectively outsource, in many ways, their the legal infrastructure to jurisdictions such as the BVI, which is well known, it's sound worthy, it's trustful, it's uh, robust. Um, all of that plays a part in terms of. It. The, the, the demand for these structures. It's a globalized, uh, certain legal structure which helps a great deal, I would imagine. Absolutely. I, I think. Um, um, yeah, I, I can add in that. I mean, the, the way it's a slightly hackneyed phrase, but um, business thrives on certainty. And I think our view is that certainly the BVI, with that underpinning of English common law, and obviously with a, with a serious court now in the BVI and an infrastructure around that provides the legal certainty and therefore um, 
when you have that certainty, that actually reduces costs, for example, going forward. People can mm -hmm. price in the fact that there is that certainty that may not be there otherwise, mm -hmm. is our experience, particularly in areas like financing, just generally structuring a deal. Great. Thank you very I much. Just have you been there as, yeah. the, uh, as the only non-practicing lawyer in this group? Um, <laughs> One of the things that we find is particularly advantageous about the as a jurisdiction is, uh, as mentioned, the, the depth of support that there is here uh, and understanding of uh, the BBI legal system, the, uh, the availability of uh, seasoned and uh, you know, highly skilled professionals uh, in the legal aspects and the uh, financial aspects as well. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, just, it's interesting that, you know, you mentioned plumbing of the international finance world. I guess the, the trust structure and availability of um, that type of uh, structuring in the DDI is uh, the electricity uh, circuits of the uh, private wealth management. Ah, well, so, yeah. so, so uh, that's, that's another aspect, I think, which uh, you know, we'll be happy to discuss a bit later on, perhaps. Excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to uh, leave it there, uh, that topic for the moment. I want to turn to John. Um, and I want you, John, if you would, please, just to let's just focus down on Asia and just, just remind us uh, what, what do we need to be mindful of when we're doing business in Asia? Yeah, it's a few things. I mean, for us, the key is relationships. We've been fortunate to be here quite a long time, and, and for me personally, 15 years, you, you learn the region as you go along, and the regional diversity is quite important. I think we can all get bogged down in the PRC initially. It's the, it's the big elephant to go after, but having worked the region and travelled the region, you do see that diversity in play, and building relationships in each place and trying to understand, as Jonathan touched upon, the demands of each country may be different. We sell a similar thing in the BBI, but adapting it and making it relevant is quite an important function that we see with the lawyers and for the service providers like OIL. Um, taking the time to understand each country is quite important. Uh, BBI has a luxury that has momentum. The 25 years of momentum of being used heavily in the region helps. It opens doors, it has a high level of awareness. But part of our job is to navigate through where it's not being used quite so much and make it relevant. Um, the rule of law thing is very key for us, that the, the lack of certainty around enforcing a share mortgage or, or a, uh, a building mortgage in, in the PRC is relevant. That means that the foreign banks we act for, and we have you know, material banking and finance group, they are looking to lend money to get the mobilisation point right and get the cash flows across borders, but they want to have some certainty as the rule of law. Our job is to get to know the local law sufficiently well to intertwine ourselves in it and then sell something combined with the... Um, the other lawyers in the region. So it's not just the underlying clients we get to know, we actually try and get to know the lawyers in each country, uh, whether it be tax lawyers locally or whether it be uh, finance or corporate or otherwise, trying to make ourselves relevant and therefore the BBI product relevant. Um, and that takes time. That's a, that's a relationship we exercise. Um, there's also a relevance too to the family wealth slash corporate grey area in Asia with so much of the large corporates actually being undermined families. Um, each country has a certain number of dominant families behind it. That allows a lot of BBI products to come into play. There can be the trust planning for the founder and the succession planning for his children who may go to school in the UK now. Um, there might be a listing element for Richard and his business in terms of rich, uh, the listing side if you can develop those uh, companies and their subsidiaries up to a sufficient level. We put debt in, they take them private. Navigating through that, the private and the corporate side of the region is very important. Um, being based in Singapore, we've deliberately gone there strategically six years ago with a focus on ASEAN, mm -hmm. recognising that there was a number of smaller demand countries uh, south of here that needed to be better understood. Um, ASEAN block is on target for some sort of material event late this year. How that impacts on our business is yet to be seen, but if that's anything like a regional cooperative group that will encourage cross-border cash flows, that plays well into something that BBI can be part of, um, and it's something that we monitor fairly closely. Um, and we are seeing more demand from some of those more peripheral countries, the Philippines, Vietnam, as Jonathan talked about. Um, but again, that's a very time-consuming investment on the relationship side, rather than necessarily going after the more 
uh, world breaking past of Hong Kong and, and, and China. So, so it really is personal, it's building relationships, and it's also a process of education. <coughs> yeah, on both sides though, we have to educate ourselves a little bit about why each country is different. And, and there may be different tax drivers and different tax rules at play. And we have to be very mindful of local law change. So a lot of the focus around BBI at the moment is, is, is threats, but the threats can come very locally. So there's been changes to stamp duty law in Hong Kong and Singapore in the last five years. Holding companies to buy an apartment in Hong Kong and Singapore have been a big demand driver. Both governments wanted to slow down and cool their housing markets, so they introduced stamp duty. Things like this we have to be aware of and not just get folks on the BVI side, but actually look at the other side of the equation to make sure we're staying relevant. So, um, John, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I am going to put you on the spot a little bit. You were talking about ASEAN as, as a sort of monolithic group here, or a big group. So where, where would you see the, the keenest opportunity in some of these smaller companies, you, uh, countries you were just mentioned? Well, again, I think the challenge for the, the, those countries to be part of a successful ASEAN is that the, the very uh, family-oriented domestic dominance doesn't lend itself very well to an ASEAN flow. So the governments on the one hand want to see more cross-border interaction, but there will be a bias back to some of the older families doing well domestically. But we already see some of those families, whether it be Thailand or the Philippines, setting up investment, almost private equity family offices in Singapore, looking for family balance sheet investments throughout the region outside of their home patch. They will use offshore companies to put that together. So it's, it's actually getting to know their ambition outside of their own shore. And I think ASEAN lends to that, that they will look for, and they will look for all sorts of, the Singaporeans are looking to sell rule of law certainty out of Singapore Arbitration Centre, BBI has strong rule of law, we see opportunities potentially for BBI law to be used for the arbitration in Singapore, so we've done some work with the Arbitration Centre and the Mediation Centre in Singapore, trying to make sure that our lawyers could be relevant to the, the seat of arbitration being in Singapore. So again, trying to tie the laws of the region to us, and trying to get the cash flows monitored, and then Try to work with them. So, would you ever uh, use the arbitration center in Hong Kong, or you focus mostly on ASEAN? Right now? It's not really our call. The clients will decide where they seek. We, we have a, uh, some degree of visibility into increased use of Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, that may or may not have something to do with Hong Kong and Chinese relations. So, you can see some of the documents that we work on now are picking Singapore as a seat of arbitration, but the governing law may still be BBI. So we have to be aware of that, that not everyone wants to necessarily go to the BVI to have their litigation or their arbitration and Singaporeans are trying to, to promote it being done in Singapore. Our job is to make sure the BVI law can try and stay relevant in that. Um, and, and we try and navigate that through the, the documents we want. Well, we're going to get into a little bit more about uh, succession planning, wealth succession, asset protection a little later, but, but just on this family office thing, it just seems to be growing exponentially. Can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Singapore's um, had a pretty windfall gain over the last five or six years, I would say. Um, whether it be Russian money, whether it be Swiss bank accounts being less favoured, there's a lot playing into the Singapore uh, opportunity. Part of the challenge for BBI is to make sure that we, our companies are being used in that new demand, and not just Singapore companies. But yes, it's very real. Um, the private trust planning part for these guys, I think we've seen a certain amount of that. That's taking more time than people, certainly we anticipated. Partly there's a fee issue there that, that compared to Europe where Jersey Trust, for example, would have been historically used and paid for by Jersey clients. Asian clients are not quite yet ready in some respects to pay for heavy trust planning, but as the founders are aging and their demands for uh, succession planning are rising, we do see a move towards that. But a lot of the private wealth for us at the moment, if I'm honest, is private banking. And, and banks trying to lend into these family offices and these family structures. So we, our banking and finance business is, is, is to some extent successful off the back of banks having um, interface with their private wealth clients. Excellent. Thank you very much. Before we leave this topic, gentlemen, anyone, uh, any additional thoughts? Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I think if we're talking about some of the characteristics that are unique to Asia, uh, particularly from, a, say, a buying behavior, uh, two of the things that we see quite a lot in our business is, is focus on speed. So how quickly can you turn around uh, an order or a request um, and price? Um, now, I think you've got to sort of, if you were to compare Asia to generally a Western European market or North American market, um, those two things are, are unique in, in, in Asia. So the question around price and value is, is an interesting one. And I think the BBI has done a, a very, very uh, sound job at pricing its services 
at the at the right level. Um, it's not the cheapest, it's not the most expensive, but it but it matches the market uh, very well. So I guess the you know part of the strategic question is as the market evolves, as the market becomes more sophisticated, what should the BVI do around pricing? But um, I think certainly over the past uh, two decades, speed and uh, speed and price has been spot on for the market. And for example, a lot of the stuff that uh, BVI Asia House is doing plays to this notion of quicker turnaround time. Other other jurisdictions haven't invested in this type of uh, infrastructure. So again, it reinforces the view that the BVI is a jurisdiction that's focused on the market and will turn around things quickly or more more quicker than, than others. Great. There's someone who's in the same business as Jonathan, although in a much smaller way, of course. Um, I have to echo what he says, and, and the availability of uh, so many service providers in, in Hong Kong that um, uh, you know, well experienced and uh, capable of dealing with BVI matters, I think is really great for BVI and also for the public because you know, it drives a very high level of quality whilst keeping uh, prices extremely competitive. I have to add one of the, one of the great things that uh, has occurred out of BVI House Asia is you know, we guys who are all rivals in the business are sitting around the table together now uh, in these sort of situations, working for the common good of our industry uh, and the BVI, and that's really been a very, very positive development, I think, which never happened in the 25 years of, uh, of history um, of providing BVI services in this part of the world. So, you know, I think we're really maturing and moving along in that respect. Well, it's great to hear that BVI is bringing people together. I like that. That's a, that's a good <laughs> that's very trendy case. Um, <laughs> uh, I will give a, a Paul. Do you have anything there? You um, no, I mean, no, just to echo those those points. I mean, it is phenomenally competitive on the ground here um, and uh, yeah the, the timing is sometimes uh, very very, uh, very, very you know, very difficult uh, there's a certain impatience isn't there there's a certain let's get it done now right? yes mm-hmm. yeah. yeah I wouldn't want to say more than that yes um, right <laughs> no, I would just have one thing that I think that the, the BVI infrastructure that we mustn't ever lose sight of but what we do in our daylight hours if we can do it that quickly it is so dependent on overnight turnaround so we might be the, the cold face and the, and the responsiveness is key but for all of our businesses i can certainly speak for ours and i speak for yours too the the infrastructure of government the infrastructure of our own people in the bvi critical mass delivering on what we promise we will do overnight mustn't be understated so like, there is a there is a trade-off between uh, employment here and employment in the bvi which we're all mindful of but the two must coexist in my mind because without the sales force out here representing and being available and responsive, the product won't sell as well, but equally it won't be delivered as well if we don't have the wonderful infrastructure we have back at base. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I'd like to turn to a third topic, and I'd like to address this to Richard, if I may, and that's uh, how offshore finance is specifically working in Asia, and and uh, what is it accomplishing, and, and, and how does it work, Richard? Well, I think it echoes a lot of what the other panelists already said. It operates on many different levels. We're also seeing a change and an increased use in more complex structures, which is something that John was talking about earlier, I think, is the different uh, people talk about Asia as a, as a homogenous whole, but actually it, 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 there are quite disparate areas, and as Hong Kong has been using it for 30, 40 years. Um, and as a result, lots of the local lawyers are very familiar with how it works, they're very comfortable with how it works, they are more than willing to use it within their structures, they've worked with law firms here for 25, almost 30 years in some cases, and so they're very familiar with the product. They also are delighted that the product moves with the times. We had the New Business Companies Act in 2004, which I, mean, I know we're all somewhat biased, but at the time you'd have to say it was probably the best piece of corporate legislation that was out there. And a number of the things that BUI did in 2004, Hong Kong finally went to its own legislation last year, so that's a 10 year head start. Um, and so it, it's used in many different ways in many different areas, but certainly we use it at, we see it at all levels, across all structures, from simple holding company structures, you know, Jonathan will deal with lots of these people, someone wants to buy a house in Hong Kong, they want to put it to a big guy holding company, it's easy for them, you should have some damage to benefit, now not so much. People will be using trusts at uh, the wealth management level, um, and again, I agree that in that, in that case, it's, it's a more difficult market. The, willingness to pay for bespoke trust structure and advice is limited here but i think that applies 
I think that's a BVI specific problem. I think that would apply across any offshore jurisdiction. If there is a, a, a general unwillingness to get to a, a very high level of wealth to pay for that specialist bespoke structure. And some of that I think is because of all of the inheritance rules, particularly in Hong Kong, so simple. But, you know, there, there are very few taxes that you really need to look at. And lots of the private wealth banks will pretty much give you a bespoke package off the bat, you know, you sign up for your $5 million US account and they'll give you a trust structure on their standard planning. So the ability to, to add value there is often, it can be limited. We see funds, guys using BBI fund structures here. We see, um, as John said, lots of joint venture arrangements. People are very comfortable using BBI joint venture companies. They like, as, um, Paul said they like the rule of law, they like the availability of suitable professionals to help them drive their structures and know what they're doing, quick turnaround, they're much more comfortable investing into the PRC or Vietnam or Malaysia or wherever it is for a BDI company where they know there is a dispute, they can end up in simple arbitration or they can end up in court in the BDI with a determined rule of law rather than something that they deem as maybe not quite as uh, transparent or, or quite as certain. Uh, and people are willing to pay, I think, for that, that certainty of, of structure. And then within those general corporate spheres, I think we see BVI companies doing everything. Um, lots of uh, journals of others, lots of uh, SPV debt issuer companies, so lots of listed companies will be using BVI SPVs to issue bonds and notes. They're listed in Singapore in particular, flowing the proceeds back through the disco, um, using them for state planning purposes, using them particularly for subsidiary and holding company structures through IPOs and, and general corporates. <coughs> um, across Asia, they work at all levels for all purposes, and but they're a great product and, and a great structure to use. Well, that's a great summary. It sounds like there's more diversity and complexity in these financings uh, these days. I think that's right. I think that certainly, uh, well, but again, it, it moves around between markets as, as economies grow and develop and mature and people are more prepared to look at more complex structures. You go from very simple bank loans, debt issuances, into more hybrid structures. People who are more willing to use the companies in a more creative way because they can see the benefit that flows to them. And I think that this, you get that groundswell of experience and the professionals to back it up, which you, you certainly have around Asia, both on the, the legal, the administrative, and the banking side. People are more willing to listen to that level of advice because they can see the benefits to their business. Well, are the transactions, are the financing is getting larger at all, or is it is it not necessarily? Um, some some are big, some small. When we see some very large note issuances, some very large bond deals. We had a um, very first issuance, for example, China State Grid up in the PRC, which is the world's sixth largest company by capitalization. They used a, a BVI company as their SPV when they went to their first bond issue to the market, and that was somebody using two billion US. So very large debt issues can be run through what are you know, very simple one one dollar one share holding companies. I have to. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the renminbi, the Chinese yuan. Are there more financings being done in that currency? Um, I think that that will come with time. I think it will be interesting to see what happens with the Asian issues that John was referring to. What happens with the Asian Investment Bank when it gets up and running? Whether that's used as a currency of a convertible tradable currency and settlement currency. If so, then I think there will be more more drive towards that. It ebbs and flows and things come in and out of flame. We had a, a big push with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange 18 months ago to have dual currency listed companies because they were very much in favour of pushing the currency and being seen to facilitate trade in it. It seems to have kind of drifted sideways a bit. I'm not sure that businesses have been really persuaded of the, of the upside to their own business of doing a dual trade structure. But I think a lot of it will depend on the, uh, on the central banks and how much they facilitate the free flow of the currency. And the more that it frees up, I think the more you'll see people. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, anything yeah. to add? John? Yeah, I just had a couple of things. I think yeah, John. That 15 years ago, the more complicated uh, cross-border structures didn't tend to use BBI. 
but the debt issuance and for equity, there were other offshore jurisdictions that had a lead in that more sophisticated environment. Part of that was the availability of service providers. So a lot of law firms like ours had more lawyers in other jurisdictions, to be fair. Um, BVI has had an influx over the last 15 years, both domestically and abroad, of more cross-border lawyers into the industry, along with investment from John A's firm and, and others. So that, I think, has led to a, the usage has gone broader. So whereas it was volume, hold an apartment, holding company type work, and that's very important for volumes for the government, the more sophisticated use required the lawyers to catch up. And so dim sum bonds to connect your two conversations is not a bad place to start, but to see BVI companies being used to issue RMB bonds in the Hong Kong market, if they'd been around 10 years ago, that probably would have been a different offshore jurisdiction. So there's, a more, there's more comfort around BVI to do a more sophisticated, um, larger market type trade rather than a smaller sort of private type trade. Um, on the dim sum point, the RMB bonds, we, liquidity has been issued, but there's been demand from, there's been sporadic demand that we've seen, but it blows a bit hot and cold around low interest rates on US dollars and availability or liquidity of the, of the RMB. So we think it's here to stay. Um, and there is some track record in a relatively small market um, of BDI being used, so that's positive. Excellent. Yeah, just one other point around, um, specifically from, from an Asian perspective. Um, we, we've seen a real growth in demand for um, asset protection purposes, particularly around intellectual property. And if you look at the growth in uh, IP registrations or trademark registrations in countries such as China, Japan, and Korea, those three countries now occupy three out of the top five spots globally. And so typically Japan and Korea, if they were to invest cross-border, they would have done so directly, Japanese company directly investing into uh, an, a, third, uh, a third country. But uh, there's some interesting developments in, in terms of there's some new markets opening up in terms of use of BVI companies, specifically for holding uh, IP uh, as, as a protection. So again, it's I think there's kind of a, a theme here where it's a little bit of sort of horses for courses and uh, across the region there's diverse, uh, diverse uh, demand and diverse uh, solutions. Um, since you have opened up the topic of asset protection, um, I will ask uh, Alan if uh, there's anything you'd like to add to, to what Jonathan was just saying. Certainly, yeah. I mean, uh, I'd like to say a few things about asset protection and also about um, uh, succession planning, which sure. are both quite hot topics um, for BVI at the moment. In fact, I'm glad that Jonathan clarified that the asset protection we're not always talking about protecting the assets of surgeons from uh, their negatives, um, which has been the traditional view people have taken of, of asset protection, of course, and uh, that is one view of asset protection, but it's not one that the BVI has ever been actively involved in. It's never been a jurisdiction that has sold that type of asset protection trust. I'd like to also thank uh, Richard for indicating the difficulty of getting clients to pay for bespoke trust advice. I'm going to uh, rely on that next time you seek advice. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, yeah, it is interesting um, that uh, it's not just the, the fees and the, uh, the cost of the advice, which has been something of an inhibitor, I suppose, to uh, trust structures in particular for succession planning and, and asset protection. Um, but also the reluctance, not only in this part of the world, but every part of the world, I suppose, to go through that ultimate step of divesting oneself of uh, hard-earned uh, assets into the hands of, uh, of a trustee somewhere in some far-flung jurisdiction. But I think there's, uh, there's an increasing sophistication in this part of the world, in, in Hong Kong, and I think increasingly in China, uh, understanding the, the benefits for succession planning of using trusts, uh, asset protection in the best possible sense of the word in terms of preserving family wealth for, for future generations and ensuring that it's managed effectively and uh, properly going forward. Uh, and that's an area which I think the BVI has become increasingly successful uh, in uh, providing those sorts of uh, those services. The past uh, 25 years, BVI has been a jurisdiction where uh, the BVI companies, of course, have been the uh, gold standard in terms of uh, offshore corporate uh, structures. And that, in a way, I suppose, has uh, created a situation which 
people are now starting to become aware of, which is that there are many hundreds of thousands of EVI companies in the hands of um, individuals or perhaps in the hands of uh, nominee shareholders uh, with ageing uh, beneficial owners uh, or ageing shareholders who are now facing the prospect of providing for orderly succession of those assets in the EVI companies. And I think that that's provides a very real opportunity for uh, all the EVI family in terms of the very flexible trust structures that are available, the Vista Trust, which is you know, a very popular vehicle for providing a, a kind of uh, Rolls Royce of uh, nominee arrangements, I suppose one way to describe it. The, the very flexible and innovative approach to private trust companies and you know, the EVI who Main, remain very light on their feet in terms of developing a private trust company, uh, which is a very popular vehicle, of course, for family offices, which we mentioned beforehand. So I think, you know, in that in that respect, you guys doing a very good job of moving beyond this perception in many quarters of being purely a corporate jurisdiction and being a jurisdiction where there is a very wide range of uh, financial and uh, structuring opportunities available. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Paul, let me turn to you on the same topic. Yeah, I mean, I think we see um, the BVI has been heavily used over the years for wealth planning in, in, uh, in Asia, uh, it's very well recognized in Asia. Um, of course, it, it is also unlike, uh, for example, here in Hong Kong, some of the, a lot of the services that are provided, the trusteeships, uh, directorships, these sorts of things are, are regulated in BVI, so that, you know, it's quite an important feature and something something to remember. Um, I would I would echo that uh, there is this uh, reluctance on what to pay for the structuring advice. Um, in our experience, that's right up until the point that families had a very bad experience previously, and then they're actually at that point. Uh, they understand the value of, of, of the advice that, that, that can be given, and uh, the fact that having all your assets in the structure, it's actually very important to get the advice right. You can take very, very specialist advice on it. Um, I think there's been some recent, Asia has its own unique challenges around wealth and succession planning. Um, I think that's probably highlighted by uh, a recent report that's suggesting uh, amongst the very wealthy Asian families, something like 91% foresee their business continuing into the future, i.e. they're not looking, when they're looking to plan for a succession, they're not looking to divest that business and, 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 and turn it into some form of bankable assets. So they're they looking wind for, down. They no, they're, they're looking for continuity. They're, mm -hmm. they're looking to create an institution going into the future. Interesting. And I think uh, BVI is, is is well placed with trusts like the Vista Trust, very well placed with uh, private trust companies as well. And the levels of, of control that they provide to, to the patriarchs and, and settlers. Um, so I, I, I think uh, it, it stands, uh, it's experience of, of having, uh, having uh, worked in the wealth structuring side of things in, in the past is, is good news. Well, I like your thought that uh, many of these families have tried the rest and they come to the BVI and they try the best, so that's, that's very good, <laughs> I, like, I like that. Um, well, thank you very much. I'd like to, in the interest of time, I'd like to move on to uh, a, a, a general group discussion. I have a couple of themes here I'd like to run through. Where I'm going to open it up really to to all of you uh, rather than taking you in turn. So my, my first question is regarding the BVI in, in Asia, the outlook, the opportunities and challenges. Um, we've talked about the demands above, but let's talk about the, the environment here in Asia. Um, for example, let's talk about regulation. Um, what, are there any regulatory frameworks, anything we should be talking about, challenges, opportunities, um, that sort of thing? Who would like to? Yes, John. I wasn't volunteering. Um, yeah, look, I think we've been relatively fortunate for a long time that some of the regulatory environments in Asia have been less focused on BVI than some of the European and US markets might have been. That said, I think the fact that we're ahead of the BVI is ahead of the curve on AML is very important. We were uh, invited last week to the Singaporean Law Society is looking at new regulation for the lawyers there, and there's a whole draft um, set of rules to apply to the lawyers and, and lawyers taking on new clients and AML 
and it was with some relief and some pride we were able to bat straight back and say, well, this is what BBI's had for years. So uh, it's a very real and current example of where we have to sell the story, but we don't have to be defensive about it. We actually have very good AML. Um, to the BBI's credit, I think uh, we have to be mindful of external pressures. I don't think publicly available register of members pressures out here in Asia are as strong as they are with the camera in the UK, for example. Um, we will be having to deal with that if changes are brought as a result of regulatory pressure in the US or in the UK and they become universally applied within the BBI. Our challenge will be to navigate that in Asia. They may not be generated by Asia, those changes, but they'll be consequential, if you like. So we, we don't see huge amounts of regional pressure to change the way BBI operates. You know, contrast some of our other regions that we operate, there is some pressure but not the same level of materiality you would apply to the UK or to the US, but we have to be mindful of how we would um, and deliver our services in, a, in an environment where they may change. So um, yeah, we, we, we monitor the regulation pretty closely. Um, I was Richard, yes, very much John has to say, and I think that it's not an Asian driven process. I think that much of the, the headwinds that confront the industry are generally European driven. I think that it is, and so the beneficial ownership register, which just seems a, a political football that's convenient to kick, it seems unworkable in practice. And you know, how you would ever have a beneficial ownership register with a trust company with a bank, for example, an employee share scheme or anything of that nature where options have invested? How would you possibly determine? Who beneficial owner these assets were? If you have a DUI company holding an NPF, for example, how would you possibly get behind the beneficial owners of these entities? That's what trust is there for them. The fact that the entire industry is so well regulated and has been for so many years in the DUI, with all the service providers being subject to strict regulation, anti money laundering, which, and the, the Know Your Client checks, which I know will cause us all those conversations with our Hong Kong and Singaporean council who are shouting as to one of them haven't managed to get the deal done in less than 24 hours and you're putting out that you need a photocopy of the man's passport before you complete these checks. But I think they stand the industry in, in, in good stead. I think you can show the uh, clean house and the more of the way on something. But doesn't it, as a general, I'm just going to throw this statement out, with all of this regulation going on, doesn't it create sort of a level playing field around the world? Doesn't it hit all jurisdictions just about the same? And so then some of the other things you're talking about that the BBI can do comes into play uh, as, a, as a selling point, as it were. Would you agree with that, Jonathan? Uh, I, th I think it depends. Um, I think we're talking sort of regulations at a, at a macro level, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that it is heading towards a even playing field, but if we sort of head down the path where certain jurisdictions, and let's take the BBI, and this, is, this comment's more relevant to, to service providers rather than the, sure. the law firms, but you know, the question of the eligible introducer regime is, is a hot topic at, at, at the moment. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of discussion, a lot of dialogue, a lot of debate around what's the best way 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 forward. Um, you know, I, I, th I think Alan and I would, would share a similar view here that we need to be very careful around what what, what we do with the um, with this regime. It's it's been the backbone of driving you know the real sort of volumes of growth that we've seen in Asia. So that that's where we have the potential around some jurisdictional arbitrage. If the DUI would go down the path of of discontinuing the regime and other jurisdictions were to continue that, then then I think there's some, some issues that we'll create. But I think at a macro level around AML and KYC, yeah, that, that is a level playing field. But when we start talking, you know, jurisdictional specific um, uh, implementation, then I think there's uh, not necessarily a level playing field. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that, Jonathan. I mean, I think, you know, in the past there's been what one might describe as a flight to the bottom, you know, where, where people have been going to jurisdictions which have uh, had sort of lower regulation and perhaps lower cost, but uh, the increased uh, level of global regulation, I think, is now creating a situation where uh, there's a flight to quality. And, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, the service providers are improving the quality, uh, and uh, the product, as a result, improves the quality. And I think it's it's the good of the industry, really. Uh, you know, one of the one of the impacts, I suppose, that uh, the whole offshore industry is experiencing in Hong Kong and other places is a indirect form of regulation, really, which is the regulation of banks, which, um, because of the stringent uh, KYC and other issues that they have. Uh, it becomes more difficult to uh, for offshore companies and indeed onshore companies in Hong Kong to deal with banks. But again, you know, I think that just really uh, provides a higher level of quality in the service and uh, in the industry as a whole. Well, 
you've got the job to feel like I think that point is absolutely spot on. You've seen over the course of the last 18 months, until about three, six months ago, a, a tendency for clients who would normally have gone straight to a BBI as their preferred jurisdiction of choice and chosen other what we personally consider to be slightly weaker jurisdictions. And the net result has been that after about a year of, of that, people discovered that the second they want anything done, they want a legal opinion written, they want some advice, they want share which is written up. There simply isn't the infrastructure that, that John was talking about and the, and the support in Asia and within the home jurisdiction to enable that to be done on any sort of the timeline that they're anticipating. And they're, they're quite used in Asia to be able to pick up the phone and speak to Alan and Jonathan and get a company delivered to their desk that afternoon to be able to speak to the lawyers around the table and get legal opinions written overnight, have documentation filed with, with regulators within 24 hours, and the whole transaction to be done very seamlessly and very smoothly. And, as a result of that move to other jurisdictions, we've seen people come come moving back and um, almost, uh, you almost want to make them apologise for their foolishness when they realise that you need to build. It's time for the more now. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what's interesting is the, the BBI government, um, it's clearly demonstrated it wants to be a good world citizen. It, it's keen to engage with regulators from other jurisdictions. Uh, and supranational bodies and, and to be uh, reviewed and so on and so forth. And I just think the way that the offshore industry is going, the ability to deploy capital in and out of jurisdictions going forward and the barriers that are likely to be used politically in doing that is very important to have a government that, that, that is focused on maintaining those relationships. I think one point that um, needs to be mentioned uh, is, you know, for many years in Hong Kong we've had uh, personal data privacy protection legislation, <coughs> but the, uh, the, the provisions regarding transfer of personal data outside of Hong Kong have never been enacted for various political reasons. Uh, there is now a suggestion that those uh, provisions will be brought into force, uh, which will obviously have very significant uh, ramifications for everybody who is transferring personal data uh, from, uh, from Hong Kong to other jurisdictions. So this is something that I think in the future um, will necessarily need to be uh, the subject of some attention both from the industry and from uh, the UI government. Interesting. I want to uh, just move, we have, I have a number of questions here, but I, I just want to move a little bit to um, what makes an offshore jurisdiction competitive? I think you've been talking around it, but I wonder if, if one of you would like to sum up, in your opinion, what, what do you think the characteristics are? Maybe you've mentioned it already. Maybe it's, it's uh, the, the rule of law backing it up. Maybe it's the versatility. Maybe it's its ability to finance in various situations. And perhaps we've summed that up already, which would, which would bring three letters to mind that I know of. Um, but you would all agree with that, I think. Yeah, it's, it's branding. You know, yes. you know, BBI has a, an excellent brand and has had many, many years. And uh, those who have been in business for a long time know many jurisdictions who have uh, come with one gimmick or another that they've tried to uh, make serious inroads into BBI's market share. Mm -hmm. And it's never been successful because, you know, people know uh, BBI, they know the level of support, they know the strength of the infrastructure, and it just is a, it's a very strong brand. And, uh, you know, it's, it's axiomatic in Hong Kong. Everybody refers to offshore companies as BBI's, regardless of the jurisdiction they're from. Right. BBI is a generic term uh, for an offshore company in this part of the world. The brand is that strongly entrenched. So one, one thing you mentioned, which is not really probably answering your question, but language skills. The, 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 the industry uh -huh. here is, because of the investment that um, the government has made and the firms have made, um, having that language capability shouldn't be lost, I guess, in today's Asian focus. That's probably my fault. That was my question. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's a part of it. And the BBI government having PRC characters on on the name was a small thing, but it's a very clever thing, you know. And some of these small changes that come through industry consultation are quite important. So um, not every jurisdiction, when you go back to depth of talent and provision of services, will have the language capability. We run a Cantonese hot desk for one of our banks. We have two or three lawyers who can speak. And, and are available 24 hours a day to speak Cantonese. That sort of thing actually goes a long way to driving volume. So that's part of it. I think to answer your original question, um, you know, tax can be a factor in all this. Not having a tax system, uh, zero tax is important. Um, but equally, it goes back to one other point just quickly. Mm -hmm. That's not always relevant. So someone, some countries, some clients may need a double tax treaty. So we, part of our job, as I said earlier, is navigating. There'll be certain deals that won't be relevant, clearly zero tax. 
they're actually looking for a double tax free network and that will play into form another country, another offshore jurisdiction like a Mauritius or a Seychelles because the demand is actually looking for a different product. And that's back to the point about trying to understand what we're selling and what people are trying to buy and, and match up that supply and demand because it won't always be that our offshore elements are what are required by the deal. Well, that's a very good point. I want to stay with you on something like that. I want to go into something a little different. So in China, there's now low fertility and the population looks like it's going to be slowing down. Does that... How do these various demographic factors, does that figure into how the BBI is going to be used or continue over time? And, and also, I'll just, I'll just kick in, there are different in inheritance tax rules and different objectives from these families, so how do you arbitrage all of this? I'll go back to the earlier answer about trust planning and yes, but Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe sort of China from a, um, from a more macro perspective to start with. I mean, I think the industry, particularly the, the BBI, if, you, if you're if you looking to put some bets on the table, uh, China's clearly one of them. Um, I think two of the, one of the key trends that we've all seen over the past few years is this uh, swing towards outbound investment. So it's only in the last couple of years that the amount of capital flowing from China to the rest of the world exceeded the amount of capital coming into China. Now, that's, that's important for two, re two reasons, because the BBI and, and, and Cayman, have still be, are still the number one and number two offshore jurisdictions to facilitate flow from China to the rest of the world. So that's the first point. The second point is obviously as the RMB continues its liberalization, timing, who knows, and there's also the fact that the, there's a central government policy to promote outbound Chinese investment. So you triangulate those three sort of data points and you can see continued growth of Chinese investment going to the world. You look to what's the plumbing that enables that. Again, it's you know, BBI, uh, another sort of um, uh, top end uh, offshore jurisdiction. So I, I wouldn't see China's, there's a whole, you know, China's, we, we talk about China as one country, but, um, you know, there will be booms and busts in China, I think, over the next few years. But uh, in totality or on balance, I think uh, China's going to continue to be uh, a major sort of source of growth for, for the industry. Excellent. Cheers. The success example as well as success keeping success. We've had 10, 20 years of the inbound where Chinese entrepreneurs in particular have become very familiar, very comfortable with BBI structures. They've only got to have some high debt and money into their BBI holding companies. They've been very comfortable with how it all works. They like the lawyers they work with. They like the legislation. They like the flexibility. They like the fact, as John says, that the government is prepared to change things. They can have Chinese names in their certificates of incorporation. They can have transliterations rather than direct translation so that there can be the, the you know the, the cultural sensitivities to the use of the lucky sounding name that isn't a direct translation has been understand it. But because of that twenty years of people becoming familiar with BBI in that direction, where they've turned to start sending the money back out, they'd be more than happy and very comfortable with using it in the other way around. And and I think that the success of the money coming in and the people working on building that familiarity has then enabled the Chinese entrepreneurs are looking to take the money out to use them as almost the default. Unless John says there's a, a tax driver for somewhere else and you don't need to be in the The BBI is one of the default companies to go to for the money coming out for, because of those familiarity reasons. Right, thank you on that. And the final uh, point I'd like to ask each of you, or collectively or individually, is if you could look beyond the current horizon and prognosticate a bit on the prospects for growth for the BBI in Asia over the next five to 10 years. So. What are the key areas to invest in and focus on? Have we answered that? Oh, so I don't think you have to We've got to away our first friends for the next 10 15 years. I've got my broker on speed dial, so don't worry. I think uh, in terms of growth, I think the growth, I think the ability to use of the listing vehicles, the listing vehicles accepted onto the exchange, they've been to the successes. Other jurisdictions are starting to see the development of two jurisdictions, but I think jurisdictions, but I think will become more accepted as the stat momentum builds, momentum builds, become more familiar with it, more familiar in terms of terms of growth opportunities. I think as we found on this age and age, people become more prone to mitigate global wealth. 
Good growth in those areas where you saw it a lot of the large number of based families, and that's why we go those major disputes, and most each of the shareholders and all the other holders. And I think that's, as the sun says, B grants, you know, there's B grants for a lot of lots of structures, lots of lots of other zones that age you know, the streets become more common because the uh the growth in that the growth of some of the growth in that level of the next I agree and I think that the number of the number of these uh holding wealth or more wealth families or uh who are aging uh who are aging who are needing to do uh some kind of succession planning uh is really a sort of uh embedded value embedded in the BBI company base because there's going to have to be some action taken to respect all of those companies, whether it's forming a business trust or some other kind of structure to deal with the uh, orderly succession of those, those shares. And as I mentioned before, I think this is this is the great sort of uh, elephant in the room for the BBI companies with such a, uh, a large accumulated base of base uh, corporations which are uh, going to require some Dealing going forward, dealing, whether it's a uh, uh, structure or even a sort of probate or, or administration in the BBI. So I think we're going to see a lot of growth there. Uh, and private trust companies, family offices are going to be, I think, one of the drivers of that as well. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I mean, I'd echo the comments around drivers and, and usage, but <clears throat> perhaps the two comments I'd make would be firstly around a focus. I think focus is an interesting one in the BBI's case because I think part of its competitive advantage is the fact that it hasn't focused solely on one solution. Part of its advantage is the fact that it can provide multiple solutions for multiple demand drivers. So I think uh, keeping the sort of broad, broad brush would be important for the BBI rather than trying to sort of focus down too much. But point is one. The second point is um, you kind of mentioned the question around a disruptor. So we often sort of, you know, over a beer think, what's, what's the Uber of the industry? How, how could this industry be, be disrupted? And um, I don't know the answer, but I think one of the things that the BVI will need to think about is how do they better leverage and utilize technology? Uh, if you go back to sort of particularly from an Asia context, speed, efficiency, turnaround time, all of these things will become more important moving forward. So how does the jurisdiction, you know, invest in, as I say, leverage technology in a way that perhaps it isn't at the moment? So if I had the answer, I'd tell you, but <laughs> <laughs> I just <laughs> said no. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Paul, any thoughts? Yeah, I'd echo the, I mean, there is that close relationship between um, the primary the client world and the business world that we see here and and the, the way that BBI is used for that. We, we see that becoming probably more institutional business going forward. Um, we certainly see actually BVI used more frequently in, in some of the very large deals that are done now um, without question. Um, it, it's in there as, as one of the jurisdictions that, that's uh, used by the blue chip uh, institutions in, the, in this part of the world. Um, I think what's important is uh, and I go back to that ability to, to deploy and redeploy capital. International relations and, 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 and the BVI government maintaining those is, is absolutely critical. Um, and in Asia, with all the various governments that you have here, and there are opportunities at various times uh, with each of those con countries, and uh, it's a question of being smart in terms of the access that the jurisdiction has with each of those governments. Not an easy thing. Thank you. Um, John? Um, yeah, I suppose, not to finish on a pessimistic note, I, I just think we have to be realistic about the threats. I think that we, there are, we're in an emerging market zone in the world that is, is benefiting at the macro level from the cash flows and the investment, and BVI is the established means of getting through that traditional emerging market period. But that said, emerging markets are going to emerge to somewhere. Singaporean companies, Singapore government wants to have them used more commonly. Hong Kong's got drives for a funds industry, Seychelles and others are on the move. So I, I wouldn't like to just forget about the fact that there are a lot of competitive factors at play here. And the momentum is the great strength, but we have to keep investing in it and keeping it front of mind that BVI is the one to use because the competition is real. Um, but I think the BVI has a tremendous head start in a number of areas we've talked about today, and I think it's been a a very positive and accurate reflection of where we sit 
but I'm I'm a realist in the sense that we experience relatively frequently at the coalface that the competition for jurisdictional comp- competition is quite real. Well, I, I, we're out of time. I'd like to thank you very much. This has been, I've learned a lot and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time.